Thank, thank God. What, what an incredible week we've had. I cannot believe it's Friday already. And uh, God is going to help us yet again. I'm so grateful to all of you that uh, have come. You have uh, prayed and given and expected. There's such an atmosphere of, of uh, faith and expectancy here this week. Uh, I am so grateful. Uh, I, I got to confess, God keeps moving like this. It's interfering with my nap time. It's really hard to nap when you're excited. And uh, who cannot be excited when you see what God's going to do? Turn into your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 5. Luke, chapter 5. In Hanoi, Vietnam, a food delivery man, he was waiting in his car for a customer when he heard residents of a nearby apartment block shouting. He said, I looked up and I saw a child climbing the railing on the 12th floor. I immediately opened the door and I tried to climb the, the metal roof on the ground floor to catch her in case she falls. He said, I just climbed onto the roof and I slipped uh, when I saw the baby falling. He said, I slipped, but I extended my arms out and thankfully the child fell into my arms. He says, even though I'm in pain, I felt like I was able to do something meaningful. So here's the point I want to make <coughs> from that, that uh, uh, news item. That man was positioned for a catch. In the right place, he was positioned for <coughs> a catch. In the, the text that we're about to read, Jesus instructs the disciples, launch out into the deep because what Jesus wants and what we're going to concentrate on on the final night is Jesus wanted them to be positioned for a catch. That's what I'm going to preach on, position for a catch. Luke 5, starting at verse 1. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, saw two boats standing by the lake, the, but the fishermen had gone out from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. The Simon answered and said to him, Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats and they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. Also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. And when they brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. Position for a catch. I want to talk, first of all, I want to talk about frustrated fishermen. The reality of life that we see in this passage is sometimes things don't work. Verse 5, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. And sometimes that fact that sometimes things don't work, it messes with our heads. Sometimes it, it usually works. It's not now. It works for others. Why not me? It worked for us before. Why not now? We toiled all night and have caught nothing. And sometimes, in fact, it's even the things that God told us to do is still not working. God told me that I was to go to South Africa. The pioneer, Lisa and I, Emily, we left an established church in Melbourne, uh, Australia, to pioneer for the second time. And so 
Now, once again, from established church, we opened in Johannesburg, and we're in an empty hall looking out of the window waiting for people to come. One Sunday morning, no one came. Remember, God was the one who told me to come there. Emily was eight years old. She had never been in a pioneer church before. We had, when she was born, we always had established churches. I'm looking out the window, and she said, Dad, this is stupid. <laughs> she said, what are we doing here? We had a church. Why did we leave? And I said, get thee behind me, Emily. <laughs> but you know what? In my head, I was going, yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> in our text they're washing nets you know what they're doing maintenance pastors here you ever feel like your whole ministry is maintenance <laughs> refereeing conflicts playing detective about sin trying to keep ungrateful people happy and involved can you imagine the rest of your ministry, that's all you're going to do is maintenance. I would rather have a root canal without Novocaine. <laughs> Listen, we are living in unprecedented times. And they are absolutely demonic. Various things in persecution, all that. Let's just talk about coronavirus for a moment, you've heard every person that's reported all week, a lot of the sermons have mentioned this. We are in the, still the coronavirus era. I, I don't care to debate with you, where did it come from? Is it all a government plot? Is it the mark? I don't even care about that. You know what I care about? Coronavirus is demonic. Almost in a way that I have never seen. Attached to it is demonic spirits. There is spiritual and mental oppression and assault on people's faith that somehow is connected to this sickness. The effects of COVID that last after people uh, 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 recover of panic and anxiety and fear and, and overwhelming despair. Nothing works. Nothing is ever going to change. That is demonic. We've toiled all night sometimes and caught nothing. But listen to me, at all times in life, there are dual purposes at work in the events of life. We see the enemy. The Bible says we have an enemy of our souls called the adversary. That word means one who stands against or opposes. He tries to stop. He tries to hinder the will of God and the people of God. He inspires people to act against us. He arranges unhelpful circumstances. And at the same time, the target of his assault is God's people warring against our minds and hearts. This is what happens when you're toiling all night and catching nothing. You, you begin uh, these inner conversations of what's wrong with me? What's wrong with the people? What's wrong with God? And that is from hell. The temptation in struggle is to base our actions and expectations on past or current experience. We fished all night and caught nothing. So it would be natural to conclude, so why try? Based on the way things are right now, why try? Everything is against us. So that is the one side, that is the enemy, but at the same time, in the same circumstances, God is working his purposes. He's working his, in us. God uses the, the strategies of hell and negative circumstances to help us. Struggles change us. Struggles refocus our vision. Struggles can help us to change direction. We've had numbers of workers that were laboring happily in China, and all of a sudden, you're out. So, wait, wait, but didn't you tell us to go there? 
And in the middle of struggles, there are men that they're discovering God is leading them to different places. God is wanting to work through us to help other people. And at the same time, it feels like our heads are going to explode. God is at work at that very moment to turn things around. I wonder, think about Joseph in the book of Genesis. I wonder if he woke up discouraged the very day he was released from prison and made prime minister. I wonder if he woke up that morning. Uh, it's never going to change. Because God is working his will. Listen, in this text, just think about this simple thought. God knows exactly what you're going through right now. In this text, I want you to notice Jesus came to them they didn't go to Jesus. Some of you came hoping that somehow if I can find God this week, listen, God does not want to leave you where you're at. If you are in the middle of toiling all night and nothing is changing, God does not want to leave you there. His plan in this text is breakthrough, a great catch. He wants to overcome the current circumstances. It doesn't matter the length of time, the way things have been going. Jesus saw a man at the pool of Bethesda knowing he had been paralyzed for 38 years. And yet, he did not want to leave him there. In this text, Jesus wants to take us into deeper water. Verse 4, launch out into the deep. He doesn't want to leave us stuck in frustration. Out in the deep is a breakthrough. For some of you, he wants to give you a breakthrough in the very area where you currently are stuck and frustrated. He wants to give you more of what you are seeking fruit or disciples or financial breakthroughs and then I love in this text when Jesus shows up he brings more than they ever imagined Jesus could you please help us to catch some fish oh he can do that but then he says I'm going to make you fishers of men I have greater plans Whatever at this moment that you are thinking of, oh, if only God could, I tell you, God can do more. How many of you believe that? <laughs> Look secondly at the greatest word for a moment. In the midst of their struggle, Jesus speaks. In verse 4, he says, launch out into the deep and let your, down your nets for a catch. What Jesus told them to do made absolutely no sense. This kind of fishing, net fishing, that it's describing here was done at night. Using this kind of nets during the day, it will not work. But that's what God says. God tells us to do things that go against common sense. There are people that are here, you came struggling financially and God challenged you to give money away. It's like, if I already don't have enough giving away, I don't know if you paid attention in school, that means I have less. <laughs> that will not work. And yet, that is the word from heaven. For some people, it's history. It goes against history. Do you know what? Every conference, we launch some couples out to cities where people have tried before and it didn't work. Wouldn't it make more sense? Let's find some virgin city that no one has ever gone to. <laughs> and yet, Jesus speaks and tells people to go. Personal experience, I tried before. It didn't work, nothing changed. But in this text, Jesus speaks a higher word. Verse 4, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And he wants them to believe it. That is what faith is. Faith is not denying that there are, that what the facts are. 
It is simply recognizing if Jesus speaks, there is a higher reality. That is why the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. You know what that means? That doesn't mean you're a liar, you're a liar, you're a liar. That's not what it's saying. What it means, if there is ever a conflict between what I feel and the Word of God, what I can work out with my brain and the Word of God, guess who wins? Let God be true. That is what faith is. You know why Jesus says you can have faith? It's because He knows how to help us launch out in the deep. Why? Because Jesus knows where the fish are. He already knows it. It, it doesn't tell us this, but apparently at some point, I don't know if Jesus nodded or they're waiting, like rowing, row. here, okay. Because Jesus knows where the fish are. John 6, 6, this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Do you know this? You came to conference with problems. God has no problems. The only thing God has is solutions. He, he's not sweating COVID. He's not sweating economies. He's not sweating the evil people you think you have. He's not worried about it. God has solutions because he knows how to fix things. Right now, some of you, you're crying out for fruitfulness. Can I tell you? God right now knows what their name is. He already knows. Launch out into the deep. He knows where the fruit are. He knows where it is. He knows who the answer. There are people, you're, you're struggling. There, you, you need someone with power to give you some favor. God knows who that person is. God knows where the building is. The owner is. He knows this. Everything. He knows when the answer is. That is why he says launch out into the deep. Listen to this. Pastor Bruce Larson said he had a man in his church who was a chief engineer in a laboratory. This is what the man said. He said, we made 200 amplifiers for an order. And not a single one of them worked when we finished. We checked the blueprints. We checked the parts. We could not find why the amps didn't work. But he was a Christian. He said, I went in my office and prayed, Lord, what's wrong with those amplifiers? And suddenly the idea came to me to cross two particular wires inside the amp. It did not make sense to do that. But I went back and tried it. It worked. All of the amps were delivered in perfect working order. Listen to this. It suddenly occurred to me that Jesus knew more about electronics than I did. <laughs> oh, yes. Listen, listen. But this is, pre you might not be making amplifiers. Jesus knows more about fruitfulness than you do. Jesus knows more about money than you do. And he has the answers for this. In our text, it tells us after Jesus speaks the greatest word. Verse 5, but Simon answered and said, Master, we toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Nevertheless, it means in spite of. I can tell you the way it's currently going. I can tell you past history. I can tell you all the reasons why it won't work. Nevertheless, in spite of how I feel, human logic, past experience. Listen, faith is a stubborn thing. The woman at Shunem, when her boy died and she was going to go talk to the man of God and people are asking her, uh, where are you going? And, and, and her response was, it will be well. Sometimes that's what faith is. Faith is not, woo, I feel it. I, oh, I feel so good. <laughs> no, sometimes faith is a stubborn, I see what's going on, but nevertheless... 
Some of you need that word in your vocabulary. You need to practice with me. Say it, nevertheless. nevertheless. Come on, that's Baptist. <laughs> I, I, I said, say it, nevertheless. nevertheless. So this is how nevertheless is going to help you. Right now, we're struggling for fruitfulness. Nevertheless. Oh, you're getting this, aren't you? But my family are not saved, and some of them are backslid. Nevertheless. We're struggling financially. Nevertheless. That's right. At your word. The, you know what? I choose to believe. Listen, I choose to believe in prayer, even though we've prayed for some things and they haven't changed. I choose to believe in healing even though we prayed and some people died. I choose to believe in conversion even though some people have not responded and some people have turned back. I choose to believe in the gifts of the Spirit and prophecy even though kooky prophets on YouTube swore that Trump was going to win the election. <laughs> Nevertheless, I choose to believe God because our text says when we will speak the higher word and agree with God, a miracle dimension is released. Verse 6, they caught a great number of fish launch out into the deep. Final thought, let's talk about positioned for a catch. This is what I want to leave you with. Great encouragement here, whenever there is great assault, it is a prelude to great breakthroughs. Second Samuel 5, 17, when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king of Israel, they mobilized all their forces to capture him. Think about this. The, the devil doesn't come and go, you know, I'm going to send you two midgets. <laughs> they don't have teeth. And they'll just chew on your kneecaps for a while. No, 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 no. Here, here's David. He's, he's about to enter destiny. How many troops do the stinking Philistines send? All of them. This is great assault. But that is a prelude to an incredible breakthrough. 2 Samuel 5, 17, or, or uh, uh, 2 Samuel 5, 20. So David went to Baal Perazim, defeated uh, them there, for he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water. Therefore, he called the name of that place Baal Perizim or the God of breakthroughs. What came first? Great attack. And what came next? Great breakthrough. It was this partly that launched him into uh, being king uh, and the destiny that God had. In our text, uh, Jesus wanted them to get in position to receive a catch. Launch out into the deep. There is a position that God wants us to be in. Let down your nets. And when they did this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. A huge catch, the Bible says. Huge frustration ends in a huge catch. And the Bible says that Peter fell at Jesus' knees, not his feet. You know why? Because Jesus was knee deep in fish. A great kid. I want to get down there. That's where you get when you're getting humble, but I can't. There's so many stinking fish. So I can only come to your knees. Listen, this is a breakthrough. In the COVID era, we have never, listen, everybody's got problems. Everybody, you have different assaults that come from time to time. I do not remember ever in my lifetime something that has affected the entire world. Something, there's not a single nation, there's not a single one of our churches around the world that has not been affected. 
a demonic strategy that is so widespread and has such intensity, it can only be that God is about to do something great. Amen. Listen, do you know what God is doing? I believe he is positioning us for a great harvest of souls. That's what we call revival. I'm not talking about a revival meeting. I'm talking about genuine revival. Deuteronomy 11, 14, he will send the rains, the early and late rains, so you can bring in the harvest. One man said, during revival, God supernaturally transforms believers and non-believers through sudden intense enthusiasm for God. People sense the presence of God powerfully. Conviction, despair, contrition, repentance, prayer, they all come easily. People thirst for God's word. Many authentic conversions occur and backsliders renew. Listen, I believe God has a great harvest for us it will come in two forms. Number one, there is the releasing of blessing that comes after the great season of, of demonic assault. David, the assault on Ziklag, he comes back and the, the enemy has, has burnt the city, has it kidnapped the, their families, has stolen everything they, uh, they have. And so here he is praying. He's going to go after the enemy. Listen, after Ziklag, they didn't just get their stuff back. The Bible says they got an incredible amount, all of the plunder of the Amalekites. The Amalekites had been raiding city after city after city. God didn't just get them back to where they were before. They got an incredible breakthrough. You know what? The Old Testament law of the thief is when you catch a thief, the Bible says he has to pay back double. That's what I'm looking for. I am looking for a great breakthrough. That is what I believe is coming in our church. That is what we have felt this week is supernatural. No one has had to hype you this week. God is here because I believe that God is about to give us the great blessing that comes after a great season of demonic assault. And then... There is the great end times harvest. Amos 9, 13, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman overtakes the reaper, the treader of grapes, him who sows seed, the mountains will drip with sweet wine, all the hills will flow into it. I believe that this is our destiny. God has in the end times a harvest. It's describing uh, back in farming days uh, that uh, it's time to start plowing again. But they're going to say, but we haven't even finished reaping. The, the harvest is so immense. And I believe that is what God is going to do for us. But the key in the text, if you're going to have a great catch... We have to be positioned for a catch. Launch out into the deep. What's the answer? We need more boats. We need more nets. Verse 7, they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats. So much that they started to sing. Isn't that a great picture of church planting? You know, that's what we did last night. We sent out 10 new boats. Is that right? In just a few moments, we're going to send out more boats. Position. You know what has to happen? We need to fill the earth with pe people who believe like we do. God love other churches, whatever they're doing. Great, I don't argue with that. But I know what we believe. I got a pretty good idea when we plan a guy what he's going to do. Not always, but pretty good idea. We must fill the earth. 
Because what we are doing is we are getting in position for the great catch that God has. Some of that great catch is going to come now. And some of that is going to be the end time harvest, that great catch. And think about this. After the catch, what did they do? They were still able to hear God's voice. Here's, here's what we, we, we've been dreaming of fish and we have more fish than we know what to do with. And yet they could still hear the voice of God. Do you know what we tend to do when we pray and God answers our prayer? We tend to make our catch an idol. An idol is what gives me security. We tend to make it our identity. Who am I? Do you not know how the Lord is helping me catch fish? <laughs> and ego, and there of course would not be any egos in this place. You know the real issue is, God wants to give us a great catch, we have to survive the catch. <laughs> oh God, help me, help me, give me, bless me, answer my prayer. Okay, but when he does it, you have to survive it, right? And here's the incredible thing, is they were willing to leave the catch. Verse 11, when they brought their boats to land and for, forsook all, they followed him. This is where we began conference this week. We have to hear from God and obey. And this is where we end conference. We have to hear from God and obey because that's how we survive. That's how you move on in the will of God. I close with this story. Argentina at one time was considered by mission boards to be the least fruitful mission field in the Western Hemisphere. In 1951, after 40 years of hard work, the Assembly of God only had 174 adult church members. But people had been praying for revival in Argentina for years. An American evangelist named Tommy Hicks was invited to go to Argentina and hold evangelistic campaigns. Tommy Hicks was a Pentecostal, believed in the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm a Pentecostal. Tommy Hicks went, he tried to get to see President Perón so that he could get some help. They would not. They took him to the office of the Minister of Religion when the minister's secretary came limping in. Tommy Hicks asked if he could pray for the man in his limp. And the man replied, if Jesus Christ himself were here, he couldn't help this leg. But Tommy Hicks prayed and the man was instantly healed. Amen. Off the back of that miracle, they took him in to see the president who gave permission to use a stadium, gave access to the media. They started out in a 45,000 seat stadium and the first night they started with 6,000 people, but God began to save God began to heal. Miracles started being reported. The crowds grew so large, they had to move to a 110,000 seat stadium. They had these meetings for 52 nights straight. And in 52 nights, it's estimated that more than 3 million people attended. And they say between 100 and 300 thousand people were saved. Churches saw great growth. New churches are planted. Evangelists and missionaries were sent out. It completely changed the response of the nation to the gospel. You know what happened? They launched out into the deep and God gave a great catch. That is what I'm looking for. Oh yes, God can help us some, but I'm looking for the great catch. How many of you believe that? Thank God. I want you to bow your heads. Praise God. First of all, maybe there are people that are here tonight that you are not right with God. What you need to do is you need to leave your sinful lifestyle. You need to surrender your heart to God because God cannot bless. He's not given up on you. Others, you need Jesus. Thank God for you. Others others. 
If you want to be saved and you're lifting your hands, stand up to your feet. Stand right where you're at. Don't come here. Stand there. Stand up. Stand up. Some people there. Some people there. You want to get right with God. Amen. I want you to pray right where you're at. I want you to say this out loud. Say, Father God, I believe in Jesus Christ that he died for my sins. And I admit I am a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. I choose to turn away and live for you. I surrender my life from this moment on in Jesus' name. Amen. God, right now, touch every person that has prayed. Those that are watching online and they're praying, touch them right now. I need a miracle dimension in their hearts. Oh God, you are the one who transforms lives. And I believe that you're able to do that right now in Jesus' name. Thank God. Before we go into the announcements, it wouldn't be right if we didn't have an opportunity for God to give you a breakthrough. How many of you, while I'm preaching, you say, that's what I need. I need a breakthrough. God knows what that is. I want you to stand up to your feet for a moment. Some of you are sick in body. It wouldn't be right to end a conference of Pentecostals without praying for the sick. Some of you, your breakthrough. When we pray, that is going to be your breakthrough. Some of you, it's fruitfulness. Others, it's, it's oppression. You need deliverance. Others, it's, it's, it might be a breakthrough in your church or there's a specific need of a building or whatever it is. I preach, we are going to say, nevertheless, to the devil. And I love the story in, in uh, the book of Joshua. God gave a strategy against Jericho. You march around the city, keep your mouth shut, do it once a day for six days, seventh day, do it seven times. And at the end of it, I love this. God says, when is the miracle going to start? He said, shout. You know what we're going to do? Because we're Pentecostals, it would only be right. <laughs> we're going to shout. In just a few moments, you already know what it is you need the breakthrough for. The shout, when you shout, you are saying, now, this is what I want. What we're going to shout, if I'm preaching about breakthrough, we're going to shout with all of our might, breakthrough. Can you do that? I don't want no Baptist breakthrough, Lord. No, no, no. And I am believing at that moment, then we're going to begin to praise the Lord. And I'm going to believe there are sick people. God's going to touch you right now. There are people God is going to lift something off of you that has been oppressing you since the stinking COVID came. God is going to give breakthroughs. You're here. And God is going to give breakthroughs in fruitfulness where you're going to go back to. How many of you are ready for a breakthrough? Yeah. Amen. Then in just a moment... I'm going to count one, two, three, and after I say three, we're going to shout breakthrough, and then we're going to begin to praise the Lord. Are you ready? Yeah. One, two, three, breakthrough, and now let's praise the Lord. Oh, God, oh, God, breakthrough. Breakthroughs of healing, breakthroughs of financial liberality, breakthroughs in the Holy Ghost, breakthroughs from oppression, breakthroughs of deliverance. Breakthroughs in fruitfulness, breakthroughs in disciples, O oh God, breakthroughs in strategy, Lord God. Oh God, thank you for the victory. Thank you for the victory. Thank you, Lord God. It is done. It is done. It is done, Lord God. Oh, God.
God, right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord God, yada bakare de 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 be. Oh, God, I thank you now for breakthroughs in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah, Lord God, yada bakare de 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 be. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, I thank you. Amen. Some of you, you were prayed the breakthrough for healing. Check yourself right now. You check yourself right now. You were sick. There was pain. There was something in your body right now. Check yourself. Breathe. Bend. Move. Wherever the pain was, check yourself right now. How many of you know that God has already healed you right now? Lift up your hand. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Yes. Yes. And I want you to believe the other things you're praying for. Some of you, it's loved ones. Call them. Some of you, it's fine. Check your bank account. See what God has done. Whatever it might be. But I want you to believe that when you go home, the breakthrough of the miracle catch of fruit that God's going to help us. Thank God. Praise God. God bless you. You can be seated.